Hello, fans! Who's the leader of the club? You really have to guess. VCA, NDR, EWS. Critiquer, when we were kids, most of us probably would have answered Mickey Mouse, the world's most famous cartoon character, but once you get older, you realize the mouse is about as interesting as a real-life rodent. At least in most of his original works. Yes, I know that question's been asked more than a few times before, but it's necessary given the theme of this review, so let's give the cliché some leeway. Yes, Mickey Mouse is indeed the most famous cartoon character in the entire world, and most people do love him as kids. But when we grow up, we realize that unlike his runner-ups such as Bugs Bunny or SpongeBob SquarePants who earned their titles because of their charming and memorable personalities, Mickey... Mostly earned it by being the mascot of the world's most famous animation studio. If he wasn't, then he'd probably be about as relevant today as his big brother Oswald. At least before Epic Mickey came out. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but like most other people, I can't disagree that Mickey Mouse is generally a very boring character. Don't get me wrong, he did show legit and relatable personality occasionally, dare I say, even hilarious from time to time. But for the most part, the most memorable thing about him was his creepy pink elephants-like black oval eyes that I'll discuss a bit later. That's the thing I liked about him most, anyway. Sure, he was a huge hit when he first premiered in the late 20s, even before Disney was the icon it is today. But keep in mind, that huge popularity didn't last too long, as much better characters like Popeye or the Looney Tunes were starting to drive the mouse into obscurity. Hell, in 1953, he pretty much fell off the face of the Earth for over 30 years, not making a true cartoon comeback until Mickey's Christmas Carol. Since then, Disney has tried to make the mouse worthy of its status as the world's most recognizable cartoon characters, and most of their efforts are pretty admirable. Although some make the Golden Age Mickey look like Spongebob by comparison. <sighs> But a lot of people agree that Mickey's finest comeback is hands down when Paul Rudish took his shot at the character. The main reason being that this Mickey seems to have a legit identity. What is that, pray tell? Basically, they exaggerated his happy-go-luckiness and made him a G-rated Butter Stotch from South Park. Like Butters, he seems to be the happiest, most pleasant dude in his world. To the point where I wonder if there might be a little bit more to his sexual orientation than Disney's letting on. Oh, who am I kidding? I know there is. If you're not convinced, take a look at this. Bubblegum days and cotton candy nights, sugar-coated flights of fancy. Butterscotch drops and candy canes galore, every day is sweeter than before. But almost everyone else, save for his best friends, seem to be as friendly as Cartman, so this always results in him getting taken advantage of, dumped, or luck almost as bad as Donald Duck's. But like Stotch, he is able to stand up for himself when pushed too far, sometimes even disturbingly so. Also, being the most emotionally sensitive dude in his world, this also leads to some delightfully over-the-top reactions. Yeah, it's a little cliched, but an overdone personality is still better than no personality at all. And Disney seems to agree, as this Mickey seems to be becoming the definitive version of the mouse. What with specials, a Disney Plus spin-off after the original TV shorts ended, a Disneyland ride, a short exclusive to Disneyland, and even becoming the new face of Disney. The other characters are more or less the same as in previous incarnations, but there's no need to fix what's not broken. But of course, we have to ask which of these shorts are the best of the best? Now keep in mind, anything Paul Rudish here is fair game. The original TV shorts, the Disney Plus spin-off, the 30-minute specials, even the Disneyland stuff. Now as for what I'm going to use, you'll just have to wait and see. These are the top 10 Paul Rudish Mickey Mouse shorts. Number 10. Locked in Love. One thing I forgot to mention in the intro is that this series had a variety of shorts set in foreign countries, and in said shorts, the characters would speak the native language of said country with no English subtitles. But thankfully, they did make it fairly easy to get the essence of what they're saying. All of said shorts are great, but my personal favorite is the Korean short, Locked in Love. Said short involves Mickey and Minnie having a wonderful evening in Korea, even purchasing a love locket as a trinket, but accidentally get the lock on their hands, and lose the key which is bouncing all over Korea and they have to chase after it. Sounds really cliché, doesn't it? 
And yeah, it really is, hence why it's at the bottom. The short turned its place on this list not on account of its premise, but rather its atmosphere. This is hands down the most beautiful looking short of the entire Paul Rudish Mickey series. The colors are gorgeously vibrant, the backgrounds have great attention to detail, even the animation is a tad more smooth than usual, and the references to Korean culture and animation are a ton of fun, especially with the slapstick. We even get an awesome Korean pop song while Mickey and Minnie are chasing a warthog with the key. As for how the short executes the cliched premise, it's pretty by the numbers. They're stuck together, try to find the key, despair for a minute, nut up, and are able to get free by working together. No real variations on the cliches. So, yeah, that's all I got for this one. Nothing really to write home about with the writing, but the short is an absolute marvel for the eyes and thus was able to earn a spot on this list, albeit at the very bottom. Number 9 Adorable Couple Oh, this is a fun one. Mickey and Minnie are having a lovely outing in the Toontown Square and everyone else is embracing the joyful mood as well. Everyone that is except Donald and Daisy who are pissed as hell as usual. Mickey and Minnie won't stand for that of course and try to do everything they can to cheer them up, but when every attempt goes comically wrong, the two decide the only way to beat them is to join them. So at its core, the short is fairly simplistic, but the real shining point is how hilariously campy it is. Mickey and Minnie's lovey-dovey attitude is a riot and was a big part in convincing me that Mickey is bi in the series. We're strolling down the boulevard as happy as can be Riding around all over the town Wherever you go There's never a frown Always look up and never look down Although what sealed the deal for me was, besides that bit I showed you earlier of course, was actually when Mickey and Minnie tried being bitter. Quack! Quack! Look at me, I'm oh so grumpy! Oh boy! I'm really mad! I won't show you the whole song to stay in the fair use category, but let's just say they don't get much better at the stick in the mud act. Although to be fair, Donald and Daisy's bitter reactions are equally campy. The visuals are also quite enjoyable. The torture making many unintentionally put the two unlucky ducks through is pretty freaking hilarious. The expressions are just as delightfully over the top as the actors' performances. Kudos to the animators. And it's all topped off with a pretty freaking hilarious ending. So, Mickey and Minnie's plan to be bitter works in brightening up Donald and Daisy, but not quite in the way they had in mind. Naturally, they want to make the two feel bad to see them fighting and want to try and help them make up, in the process making up with each other and be happy again. But of course, Mickey and Minnie are so embarrassingly terrible at fighting that Donald and Daisy, not to mention the audience, start laughing their asses off, demonstrate how the pros do it, and this ultimately is what brightens the two up. With hilariously campy writing, animation, and performances, this short is a silly over-the-top delight from start to finish. Number 8 Duet for Two Mickey and Minnie are strolling through town one day and stumble across a piano, so they perform a super awesome love song called As Long As I'm With You. This draws a large crowd catching the attention of music producer Huckster McBackstabber, who offers them a music contract. Mickey and Minnie are hesitant at first since they duet to make others happy rather than for profit, but upon hearing they can make the whole world happy, they sign on but soon find there is a slight difference between seeing for profit and seeing for joy. Nothing too phenomenal, but the short does provide a very damning commentary on how shallow and heartless the music industry can be, in case that name Huckster McBackstabber didn't make that frickin' obvious. But more importantly, this is such a great display of the amazing chemistry Mickey and Minnie have, and their song As Long As I'm With You, besides being very catchy, might be the best romantic duet ever composed. I could strike it rich, become a millionaire, or sing this song without a dime to spare. But I really wouldn't have a single care, for all my, my dreams come true. This is showcased as when Mickey and Minnie go viral, they sing their duet in a variety of different musical styles. We could sail a boat from here to Timbuktu, or stay ashore and just admire the view. We could climb Mount Everest and ski back down, 
As you can hear, while it is very neat to hear many different variations of the song, none of them even come close to capturing the heart of the original piece that made them so famous to begin with. Also kind of a commentary on why modern versions of classical songs can backfire so badly. Kind of ironic coming from Disney, but glad to see they're learning. But I think the sweetest part of the short is, while Mickey and Minnie continue to overwork themselves for the sake of others' happiness, at least that's what McBackstabber says they're doing, the final straw is when McBackstabber intends to force them to do separate performances. Both refuse to perform without the other and say, screw show business. Plus, the way they get out of it is pretty freaking hilarious. Well, this contract says yes! And in case you're wondering, no, I'm not going to make any jokes about uh, recent events bearing a slight resemblance to that scene you just saw. Some areas of politics are just too sensitive for political jokes. Again, the short is nothing revolutionary, but with some solid commentary on the difference between seeing for profit and for art, as well as some of the finest display of Mickey and Minnie's chemistry, this short is definitely worth a look. Number 7 Once Upon an Apple This is a neat short because it deals with the two origins of the Disney legacy collaborating, so to speak. It starts out as a pretty simple day in the Disney universe, with Mickey being the local happy-go-lucky philanthropist as usual, and the evil queen in hag form trying to dispose of Snow White as usual. But then Mickey starts doing good deeds for the witch, all of which no pun intended, somehow or another result in her consuming the sleeping potion spiked apples she intended for Snow White. So a combination of this and learning from the magic mirror that Mickey is now the fairest in the land, though I'm sure the majority of Disney princesses would disagree with that notion, results in the witch deciding to switch the target of her assassination from the one that started it all for Disney movies to the one that started it all for Disney in general. Well, after a certain rabbit, and a certain Lewis Carroll girl, and certain silent shorts that nobody remembers called laughograms, and, well, you get the picture, but our efforts are just as fruitless, pun intended that time. So one really cool thing about the short is we see Mickey go up against the first Disney villain ever. True, the Evil Queen's not the best Disney villain, but to go up against the first is still pretty cool, but the real shining point is the comedy. The timing of the slapstick is just perfect, and just about every injury the witch endures has you laughing harder than any Wiley Coyote or Elmer Fudd has ever suffered in their entire cartoon career. Plus, there's just something so funny about the witch accidentally consuming her very own poisoned apples. I don't quite know what, maybe it's just not a concept that many people have thought of, but seeing the witch fall victim to her own trap is just so freaking hilarious here for some reason. At least to me. This bit is also pretty freaking funny. Just seeing the usually stoic and dead serious Magic Mirror turn into a hyper fanboy is just so unexpected and hilarious. Mickey's also pretty funny with how blissfully ignorant he is that this witch is clearly out to get him and continues to be the sweetest guy to her, unknowingly inflicting karma on her in the process. But despite everything, Mickey does help the queen get a happy ending. I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but let's just say it's so freaking hilarious that I am immediately going to change my mind and show it to you because I want you to see how funny it is yourselves. Allow me to introduce the fairest of them all! With a combination of great slapstick and a great premise of putting the two ones that started it all for Disney together, and you've got one ripe apple of a short. And I went happily ever after. <laughs> Number 6 The Brave Little Squire Another short with a medieval fairy tale theme. Sir Mortimer is the bravest, most heroic knight in all of Disney fairy tale land, and is looking for a replacement squire as his former one proved to be a sitting duck, 
and chooses a hyper fan of his, the brave little tailor Mickey. Mickey's psyched that he gets to be the squire to such a brave and honorable knight as Mortimer, and hopes that some of Mortimer's greatness will rub off on him someday. But his joy doesn't last too long, and finds that Mortimer actually chose him because he's actually a bigger coward than Biden is towards helping Ukraine. Seriously, Biden, get your ass in gear, and need someone brave yet gullible enough to do all the monster ass kicking for him and allow him to take all the credit for it once it's safe to come out of hiding. And the sweet but naive Mickey seems like the perfect candidate. This continues for a while until Mickey eventually catches on and resigns as Mortimer Squire, but right when a dragon is coming for Princess Minnie. So what's so awesome about this short? Well, they have Miranda Richardson guest star as the narrator. So Mortimer had saved the day, but the little squire was unsure of what the knight had actually done. Great start, but the real shining point of this short is that it's a tribute to two of Mickey's best and most beloved original theatrical shorts. That being the brave little tailor, of course, what with Mickey and Minnie's outfits, and also Mickey using strategy and wits to defeat the monsters rather than direct hand-to-hand -hand combat, and also to Mickey's rival, what with Mortimer abandoning Minnie to her fate when real danger comes along while Mickey nuts up. A great reason these shorts were awesome to pay homage to is they were among the few Mickey was actually able to carry largely on his own and still be legitimately funny. I think that's because they made him noticeably more over the top and also surprisingly more relatable here. I don't really have the time to detail that here, but if you've seen these shorts, you probably know what I'm talking about. Bottom line, best original Mickey shorts you could possibly pay homage to. Another neat thing is, when would you ever expect Mickey to idolize frickin' Mortimer Mouse? Up to now, Mickey has always been portrayed as despising this rat even more than Pete. It's pretty bizarre, but then again, maybe that's just to convey a commentary that people aren't often what they seem. Plus, Mortimer gets a nice comeuppance, where he tries to perform an amnesia charm on Mickey that backfires on him and... Oh wait, I got him confused with Gilroy Lockhart, another coward who takes credit for other's heroics. But getting pelted with tomatoes is still satisfying, I guess. And it's also equally satisfying to see Mickey get his dream to become the greatest knight who ever lived after seeing Mortimer steal all his thunder for most of the short. If there is one small criticism I have, it's that for some reason, Jeff Bennett voices Mortimer here instead of Maurice LaMarche. And don't get me wrong, Jeff Bennett is still pretty smug and despicable as Mortimer. Look, kid, squires like you are a dime a dozen. You want to be a knight like me? Then you suck it up and do as I say! But voiced by LaMarche, you just wanted to break the guy's neck. If Minnie gets herself a really sophisticated guy, it'll be game over for me. But as long as she's with you, I still got a shot. But that's really a minor nitpick in what's otherwise a very interesting and well done short. Number 5. Potato Land. This was the very first double length short of this series, and a worthy choice for that honor. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are on a road trip to a potato themed amusement park called, well, Potato Land. Goofy's never been there, but has passed by the park sign several times on road trips as a kid, and has always dreamed of visiting the place. But when they finally get there... Welcome to Idaho! Now I just potato land! Potato land! Potato land! Uh -oh. But Mickey decides he just can't break it to Goofy that the childhood place of his dreams is only a fantasy. Plus, they apparently drove three whole days there without stopping or eating, and they're not wasting gas for nothing. So he and Donald spend the night constructing Potato Land out of potatoes in a nearby field, and are determined to make sure Goofy has the time of his life at the greatest theme park in all non-existence. So as you might have guessed, Potato Land is very obviously based off of Disneyland, and most of the potato-themed parodies of Disney's own attractions are pretty frickin' hilarious. As the potato creeps all the dead oak Tree. Potatoes arrive for the midnight spree! Ah, 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 ah. But the real shining point of this short is Goofy, who might be at his funniest here, both in performance and animation. The sign! It's the sign! Your lifelong dream come true! Wow! Ah, uh, Goofy! You gotta take the blood for that. Wow! Ah! 
that, and also the bond he has with Mickey and Donald, it is pretty heartwarming to see these two put all this time and effort just to make their best friend happy. I mean, it's not every pal who will build an entire theme park and endure a ton of pain in the process just for that. And when Goofy finds out Potato Land isn't real and they went through all that just to make him happy, he gets to show how much he thinks of them. Potato Land might have been a dream, but our friendship is real. As the first double-length short in the series, it did its job of being worthy of twice the length and honoring Mickey's 85th birthday, with numerous spoofs of some of Disneyland's best attractions and also Goofy being at his best and closest to Mickey and Donald, this short is definitely a ripe crop. Plus, the short shows that there's a good reason why Potato Land doesn't actually exist. I think I just thought of a new lifelong dream. What's that? Number 4 For Whom the Booth Tolls Definitely one of the darker shorts of the original Disney Channel run of the show, but also a very nice tribute to Alfred Hitchcock. Mickey and Minnie are on their way to the park but come across a toll booth, and Mickey has no change and Minnie's only got a gold brick. So, Minnie sees no harm in defrauding Uncle Sam of such a small amount and passes one of Mickey's buttons off as a coin. Mickey tries to convince himself it's no big deal, but he can't help seeing that toll booth everywhere. So this premise may not sound all that unique at first, just the usual character does something wrong and starts having telltale heart hallucinations out of guilt until he does the right thing premise. More than a little cliched, you might say, so why does it stand out? By being an absolutely brilliant tribute to Alfred Hitchcock, complete with numerous references to his works, like Psycho... It's just a quarter. Yeah, I guess we're fine. Please insert 25 cents. <laughs> North by Northwest... Vertigo... La, 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 la. Hell, even Hitchcock and Disney Animal Form makes an appearance, and of course, what Hitchcock homage would be complete without a shocking plot twist. So around the middle, Mickey's getting pretty stressed from his toll booth hallucinations, but does start to get a grip on reality and... What the... Oh. Huh? Yep, that's right. There really was a possessed toll booth stalking the two mice for vengeance. I sure didn't see that coming, but thankfully, Minnie still has that gold brick, so they get changed for a quarter, pay the toll booth, and it backs down. Talk about a hilarious way to defeat the villain. With numerous Hitchcock references and an unpredictable Hitchcock twist, this show is one of the finest homages to Alfred Hitchcock one could possibly ask for. Plus a nice message about how, small or not, a crime is still a crime and may come back to haunt you in unexpected ways. Number 3 Just the four of us! While For Whom the Booth Tolls was the darkest short of the live TV version, this episode is definitely the darkest of the Disney Plus version so far. Donald and Daisy are at their wits end with Mickey and Minnie's extreme outings and can't bear another one tonight. So instead of hiding under a rock like Spongebob did in this situation, Donald lies and says they're sick but realizes too late that the two will be coming to take care of them. And they forgot to lock the back door. One, two, the mice are coming for you. So I know this just seems like a hilarious spoof of home invasion films, right? I mean, Donald and Daisy are just comically overreacting by viewing being taken care of by their friends as the equivalent of someone trying to murder them, right? And... Well, yeah, they kind of are, but for the most part, the short plays itself just as seriously as a full-on home invasion film. Everything from the music, the lighting, the camera shots. If you took the Disney characters out and made it live action, you'd have a full-on Wes Craven or Brian De Palma-style thriller. It doesn't help that Daisy and Donald's scared reactions are played a lot more for legit drama than comedy, rather than being hilariously over the top like you'd expect. For the most part, they seem a lot more realistic towards the fear one would have with a killer being inside their house at the dead of night. But to be fair, Mickey and Minnie actually are legitimately terrifying here. No, I'm serious. Not only are their performances pretty chilling... Are you looking for a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down? Daisy! Daisy! I hear you have the flu! Care for you. Well, well, well. Would you look at you? 
move over Nurse Ratchet. This part also kind of caught me off guard. And going back to Mickey and Minnie's prototype designs really helped with the fear in this short. What do I mean? Well, I'm not sure how many of you have noticed this, but the prototype Mickey and Minnie were creepy as hell. I seem to notice that while cartoon characters with dot eyes that are really small seem pleasant and welcoming, having dot eyes be really big, even when oval shaped, just kind of looks like they had their eyeballs ripped out, leading some really deep uncanny valley territory. This is a big part of what contributed to the terror we all got from the pink elephant scene in Dumbo as a kid. But you know what? I freaking love this look. Like another critic, I might have taken more than a little inspiration from. I also love dark, twisted cartoons, so that's why I'm so glad they went back to their prototype designs with this series. So a combination of that, their pale white skin, and their surgical masks, they look like the ghosts of serial killers wanting vengeance on the two unlucky ducks. But while mostly played for drama, the short does have a couple small laughs here and there as well. You didn't see me! <laughs> I didn't see him? My mind's playing tricks on me! <laughs> My only real gripe here is the ending. Basically, Donald and Daisy pass out while being chased in the rain by Mickey and Minnie, wind up bedridden in the hospital, think they're alone at last, and... You probably see the joke coming a mile away, don't you? But aside from that, this short more than succeeds at being a family-friendly but still effectively terrifying homage to slasher flicks. However, this wasn't the first time Mickey's proved he can be legit scary. Speaking of which... Number 2 The Scariest Story Ever This is notable for being Rusty Taylor's final performance as Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and they gave her a damn good swan song for the trio. Mickey and Donald's nephews have had quite the evening of trick-or-treating, so Mickey decides to top their Halloween off with the scariest story ever. Unfortunately, while the stories are pretty amusing parodies of classic horror movies like Frankenstein or Dracula, they're as predictable and cliched as they come, and not the least bit scary. But I mean, it's Mickey Mouse we're talking about here, who comes from the happiest place on Earth. So what chance would he have at telling a legitimately scary story? But just when he's about to give up, the boys push Mickey too far with their mocking of his inability to be scary, and soon remember that the mouse was the creation of quite a demented mind. I'll say more about this in a bit. So at first glance, the special just seems like kind of a cash grab for the Treehouse of Horror segments on The Simpsons, doesn't it? And, well, yeah, it kind of is, but it's a very well done cash grab. Oh, where do I begin with this episode? How about the animation? All of the expressions in this short are just so delightfully over the top and expressive. I don't know if these characters had expressions this hilarious even in their golden age. There are also some expressions in the scary sense, but more on that later. Then there's the callbacks. Just in the intro alone, we get references to Fantasia, Sleepy Hollow, Peter Pan, even Huey, Dewey, and Louie's Halloween costumes are the same as in the classic Disney short Trick or Treat. But even the non-Disney references are just as enjoyable. Mickey's Frankenstein story literally starts starts out with almost the exact same word of friendly warning as the original film. Plus, another reason why the Frankenstein short fails to scare the boys is because Mickey opts to parody young Frankenstein here. That's Frankenstein. Shut up, Gene. We know you're the grandson of Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Get over the shame of your disgraced family name. But yeah, this short is definitely more based off of young Frankenstein, not just with the looks of the characters, not to mention their performances, but also when it decides to be a musical. How mysterious, I'm delirious, what is happening to me? All at once I feel free. Holy took a fast of bolts, and some lucky lightning bolts to help him revive. This song, besides being insanely catchy, is just so delightfully over the top and silly. It may not have scared the boys, but it still probably would make Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder proud. The next short, based on Dracula, isn't quite as funny, but still has some laughs. Garlic and steaks. Mmm, steaks. Not those kind of steaks. Plus, their encounter with the vampire, while not particularly scary, is still relatively badass and exciting. But big shock, it ends with Van Mousing winding up as... A vampire. What? A vampire? No way! Nobody saw that coming! We, we all saw, saw it coming! coming.
Well, I saw it coming, and I can't see a thing. Plus, Mickey being pushed to tell an actual scary story is my favorite tribute to the film Carrie After Stranger Things Season 4. So how is Mickey's last tale legitimately scary, you may ask? Well, it involves the boys as juvenile delinquents in olden day Germany who rob pies left and right. But then after stealing a pie from an elderly Minnie Mouse on a McDonald's diet, the boys find the pie is even more addicting than Walter White's meth. So, unable to survive without it, they track Granny Minnie cottage down, lock her out, and scour her house for the pies, but the boys start getting snatched by mysterious forces one by one until only Huey is left. But then he finds the pie and starts gorging himself, until he discovers that old Minnie is actually a witch who has a dark secret ingredient to those pies. Hey! Who turned out the lights? Yeah! Huey? By the way, you may notice that two of those pies in the oven were Mickey's nephews, so Huey just ate one of his own brothers. So yeah, I think you can see why this short is so demented. It was disturbing enough when this happened to Scott Tinnerman, but to make someone highly addicted to food that was made from human meat, or rather duck meat in this case, but you get the point. That's probably the last thing you'd ever expect from something out of Disney, but that's exactly why the short is so delightfully bizarre. Another thing is the imagery. The locations are all delightfully artistically twisted, as are the expressions of the Mini Witch, whose true form can only be described as a mix of Minnie Mouse, the Wicked Witch of the West, and Possessed Mia from the Evil Dead remake. Good lord, these animators really need to land jobs on American Horror Story. But I think the most impressive thing is how effectively Ressie Taylor is able to adapt from her usual cutesy lovable performance to a demonic cannibal witch. Let's watch these scenes back to back. Oh, I don't just pick any little boys. I pick the most snot-nosed, rotten little boys I can find. We'll be best friends forever. Who else could it be? And you, Huey, are the most rotten little boy I've come across! I have a nose for these things. Move over, Brian Cranston. So to wrap up, topped off with the boys having the living hell scared out of them by the story after how cruel they were to Mickey, this special is one of the best Halloween specials out there with great comedy and also surprisingly effective scares for something with Mickey in it. And the number one Paul Rudish Mickey Mouse short is... Carried Away! Well, how could you not? There is so much significance to this short. First off, this was Russie Taylor's very last performance as Minnie in this series, being carried away to heaven only a week after it aired, as well as her second to last performance as Minnie in general after the Disneyland attraction, Runaway Railway, and pretty much everyone agrees you could not have given Russie a better semi-finale to her 30-year career as Minnie than with this artistically significant beauty. The premise is fairly simplistic. Mickey and Minnie are in a canoe somewhere in uh, Italy maybe? And Minnie starts to play a love song she wrote for Mickey, but then Mickey accidentally sends the canoe out into the ocean, resulting the two being carried away all over the world, with Mickey having to rescue them from all kinds of danger, which the lyrics on Minnie's song happen to conveniently correspond with. Doesn't sound like anything revolutionary, and at its core, it's not. But kind of like with the episode Honey We're Young at Heart on my Top 10 Honey I Shrunk the Kids episodes, it's not the premise of this short that makes it great, but rather the execution. It's like the creators knew that Rusty Taylor's time was coming, and they really wanted to give her the best farewell performance ever, and it really shows. The song is literally the most beautiful love song I have ever heard in my life. Sure, the joke is that the lyrics just happen to reflect the dangers they're currently in. But either way, the melody and lyrics are just so endearing and really melt your heart. Not even the orchestration version of this song that I had done just for the background of this round can capture the heart of the original piece. You also really feel the effort from Russi Taylor. Like the creator, she probably knew she wouldn't be much longer in this world, so she really put her all into this performance, and this honestly may be her best performance in her entire life. Dreaming of you. 
the humor itself is also some of the best. The pain Mickey has to endure to keep them safe, as well as his hilarious expressions, are some of the funniest in the whole series. That, it is really sweet to see him go through this hell all over Earth just to keep Minnie safe. Mortimer would have bailed out on her after the first piranha bit him, but Mickey won't stop at anything to save Minnie. How these two are still not married, I'll never know, but it really shows how much he loves her. But I think the best part is the ending. Throughout the short, it seems like Minnie is blissfully ignorant to the danger they're in, so when they're finally safe and she asks Mickey what his favorite part of the song was, Mickey naturally can't answer because he didn't get to pay attention to any of it. But then she admits she knew perfectly well what was going on the whole time, and this time anchors the boat so she can play the song again again and he can focus on it. This is even more heartwarming because it implies that Minnie was making up the song on the spot to praise Minnie for his current heroics. That's a sweet twist. While it doesn't make Rusty's death any less sad, it is still comforting that they gave her the best possible way to wish all us Disney fans farewell, with an absolutely beautiful song complete with some of the most hilarious slapstick and expressions Disney's ever offered. We know you're with your husband Wayne up in heaven, Rusty, but we all miss you so much. You were the best Minnie Mouse we ever had and ever will, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie. We all get carried away anew, 